professional development as, as a lifelong learner myself and an advocate of it. I think it's um, really critical. And coming back from the holiday kind of gives us a invigorating start to the rest of the uh, attentional spotlight is this. First characteristic. The attentional spotlight, watch this carefully, I'm going to have to unpack it, cannot multitask. I'll say that again, I'm going to unpack it. The human spotlight cannot multitask. And if you try to get it to multitask, you will squirt into your blood serum stress hormones. Because the brain cannot multitask at its spotlight. Now, the brain can multitask as a general organ, that's for sure. It's happening right now. Right now, if you're still paying attention to me, right now the brain stem is still regulating your heartbeat, still regulating your respiration, you're not you're not in conscious control over it. Multitasking here is defined as two separable inputs that have separable and independent outputs. Okay? And what I'm saying to you is that while the human brain can fully multitask, your attention spotlight cannot, and when you try to get it to multitask, you will squirt stress hormones into it, and that will affect your thinking. And I'm going to show you why it is that we know that, and show you some experiments that are directly related to classroom performance. Because if I'm saying to you that it cannot multitask, what I'm saying to you is that it cannot multitask. And if it could, you could open up a book and read one page with each eye and know everything perfect stuff first. How long does it take you to complete the math assignment? Consecutive score where there's no switching is allowed, and then an in interrupted typical two task, you can do a four task or what is sometimes called a zero task, where you're just on and then off and then on. It doesn't matter, it's almost exactly the same number. It looks like this. Consecutive score, no switching allowed, that's how many times you're gonna get done. This is how many you get done in an interrupted protocol, folks. It takes you twice as long to finish the math problems. Often thought of because if you need to concentrate and you get an interrupt, you don't know where you are, you have to backtrack. So that burns up time. Okay, there's probably some cognitive reasons beyond that too. How good is the quality of math in an interrupted versus an uninterrupted model? Consecutive score, no switching allowed, and an interrupted score, a typical two task, again, in David Spires laboratory. The error rate looks a little bit like this in the consecutive score and in the interrupted score. Folks, you have about 50% more errors. So I tell my son, I'm a 13 year old, 11 year old, by all means, if you want to get half as many math problems done and make 50% more errors on that stuff you do get done, by all means, turn on the laptop while you're studying. And believe it or not, they turn their laptops off. Less than a um, All of the information is so relevant to teaching and so fascinating, but I would have to say that the final section that we just had on listening to others with empathy and thereby reducing their stress and the importance of that for teaching, listening to a student who comes to you with a, a stress of some kind rather than being, your paper is late or you came late for class or your uniform doesn't look good. Instead of any of those sort of accusatory ways that sometimes we feel we have to act as disciplinarians, instead trying the empathy route and saying, I can see you're upset about something. I can see you're exhausted or whatever. And thereby having a much richer dialogue with them and a more caring dialogue and thus reducing their stress, which as we learned, impedes um, their ability to learn, and that is our ultimate goal, is to teach. So, I think that was my favorite. Two things. Thing A, you identify what you think you see. If somebody comes in and looks fearful, you don't say, fix it. You say, you look fearful. <laughs> simple. It's so simple. The, uh, uh, you just do it to do an affective, you make a comment, you verbalize what you think you see. Then secondly, this is the harder part, we're going to talk about theory of mind next hour and we'll conclude with this. You have to do the second part, this is the harder part. You have to make a guess as to where you think that fear response came from. If it's your spouse, you know your spouse well enough. You can't fix it again. What you try and do is that you try, it's called affective forecasting. You try and make a guess as to where you think that's coming from and maybe even where you think it's going, hence the term forecast. Okay. I'll give you an example of this by talking about the belief theory, because that's the real effect. We start teaching this in, uh, in very colorful land, and we start seeing changes in the level lab scores. But what we really see in, in is in belief theory that comes in with parent and child, oddly enough. And I think that's where the real therapeutic event comes in. So let me give you an example of that, then I'll let you take a break and we'll come back in 10 minutes. Uh, uh, here it is. Uh, one woman, she's a teacher, 
Uh, she came in, she has a teenage daughter, and they're having a normal fractious relationship that you have with teenagers often. And here's what happened to her, which is interesting. And she deployed this two-step process whereby you describe what you think you see, and then you make a guess where you think it came from. Um, she walks in the, uh, they have a rule in her house. She's got a boyfriend, the boyfriend's name is Steve. She's 16 years old. She's got a curfew. She can go out on Saturday night with Steve, for sure. She's got to be home by midnight. And that's the other thing. put the foot down on that. They live in an urban center in Seattle. It's actually a really good idea. They did it. And here's what happens. 12.30 rolls around, and daughters go out with Steve. No daughter. 1 o'clock rolls around. No dog. Two o'clock rolls around. Mom's going nuts. Underneath a lamp, sitting there waiting when the door opens. And daughter comes in. But she knows about the empathy reflex as opposed to whatever else is going on. Even though her response is delayed, the daughter says, That's a pretty, really good mom. A bit strict, a little bit kind of that. Uh, uh, she did this. She looked at her and said, she remembered the empathy reflex, where you make an assessment of what you think you see, and then you make a guess of where it's coming on. And watch the magic begin to happen here. Daughter comes in, and she's scared out of her mind, because she's going to get the hammer. And she knows it. And she knows it. She gets she goes the uh, she, she comes in, and mom immediately looks at her. But instead of saying, where were you? You know what she said? She said, you look frightened. Mom's also real sensitive because she saw something else underneath her daughter that was extraordinary. She said, Honey, you also look troubled. In fact, you look humiliated. And the daughter starts to cry. And she says, I was. The reason why I'm late. And she couldn't do any further. And mom, forgive me, mom, mom comes up and says, you broke up with Steve, didn't you? And you were late because you couldn't get her eye on. She identified what that feeling was, and she made a guess as to where it came from. Turns out she was right. And can you imagine the tears that flood that room? Unbelievable bonding. And the answer is, you bet. The more in control you feel, the more likely you are to score high on what we call fluid intelligence tests. Fluid intelligence tests, we're going to talk about fluid intelligence in a little bit. It's essentially your ability to improvise. If you feel out of control over things coming in your life, one of the first things that collapses in your life is your ability to be creative. You can no longer access the working memory that you have in such fashion that you can produce unique combinations of certain things and have a certain amount of creativity, except in one area. Do you know what that one area is? Your expression of the stress. In particular, I go away thinking about the amount of exercise that we all get every day and how much our students get. And I'm really pleased to think that we now have a wellness committee because it seems like that might be something big for us to focus on in the future as we look at learning and how to best meet our students' needs. And I took away a lot of other things too, but those were the main things. It was wonderful. The whole thing looks like this. <clears throat> Summary of seven questions. The independent variable for a polar uh, aging phenotype. Yep, it's a sedentary lifestyle. Exercisers seem more alert. Were they? Yeah, and they're there. Yeah, you can test. Could you intervene with non-exercisers and see a benefit? Yep, though the results are uneven. What parameters predict the benefit? 30 minutes, two to three times per week. Aerobic apparently drops toning. Executive functions before memory. Could the brain pathologies be affected? You bet. Both dementia and affective disorders show uh, uh, sensitivity to aerobic exposure. Was the cognitive benefit age dependent? Maybe, but only because the funding sources started out with geriatric populations and it's just now coming down the uh, ecological food chain. But if you can see the same thing in fourth graders and in 27 year olds that you see in 65 year olds, you got yourself through there. Does exercise affect academic performance? Perhaps, maybe in some cases, but nobody really knows because nobody's done it formally. So powerful is this, folks, we even know the sweet spot. There's a sweet spot of when you should teach something, project information, mathematical, quantitative information. Here it is. Are you familiar with the endorphin buzz? No, no, no. <laughs> I've gotten more familiar with it. The uh, endorphin, it's actually not endorphin, it's actually dopamine. It's a dopaminergic spike with a little bit of endorphins on the tail end. It's mostly dopamine. It's that buzz you feel after an exercise for a period of time. 
University of Trivia knew this and had a bunch of secret executives that they had to work with uh, because they're opening up a, an office in Beijing. And they were going to have all these folks go down to Beijing, but they wanted to teach them Mandarin. So they took a bunch of 42 year old Siemens executives, they knew about the seed spot, and they exercised them. And then instead of having them take a shower, which is when that seed spot comes, they stunk to the high heavens, but they taught them Mandarin. There's another type of exercise you could lift weights, you could do toning exercises. Do toning exercises change math scores, change impulse control? Does a toning exercise change executive function? The answer is no. It doesn't, which makes it a lively and good negative control in your experiments. Okay, take a look at it. If you do just strengthening exercises without an aerobic spike in sight, this is what you get. So we're going to look at a toning exercise per se. We're going to lift weights. These are statistically identical. You don't get your 180% improvement in executive function. Next question. Math is not the only thing in a classroom. If executive function is not the only thing that has a cognitive gadget. What about memory scores? How about memory? Are you familiar with age-related memory loss? Yeah? Some of you are? It's lovely to be here in Toronto with you. Thank you very much. I am certainly familiar with age-related memory loss. Does exercise, whether you're looking at aerobic exercise or toning exercise, change memory scores? Answer is no. It doesn't. You can exercise whether you're doing an aerobic uh, workout or whether you're looking at a, a, a barbell activity, looking at either short term or long term, you can look at long term here. It doesn't matter. If you do your causal type experiments, there's your baseline, the yellow is aerobic, the pink is going to be your strengthening, and you're going to do a 16 week intervention like before and ask the question, do you change the needle? The answer is no, you don't. Exercise will not improve your memory. But we now have an update, which I have to give you, since last year you may have heard me talk about these data. Actually, you can change memory scores with an aerobic workout. But you can't be exercising for 16 weeks. You have to be exercising for three years. The idea is about implementing the change in classroom. Um, is there one thing? If we implemented it on a global basis in that school, it would be something we should do. Oh, wow. Um, the easiest would probably be the exercise component, because it's the simplest to do. And it has the most robust data underneath it. So if I were to answer that question practically, that's where I would go. Uh, over here, we're going to take a look at the controls experimentals as you before. And now we're going to look at your after, which you're going to see is about 100% improvement. Well, you've seen that before. In this case, you're going to do only a 12 week intervention, and there it is. There's your spike in executive function scores. Now, we're going to stop the exercise and wait 30 days. And when you wait 30 days, and they've gone back to their own nasty habits, folks, that's what you get. In fact, you can turn it on and off like a light switch in the kids you teach. You don't have to wait for the geriatric research to come alongside. Uh, definitely, uh, the key thing I think was keeping uh, short segments of 10 minutes. Um, not assuming that students are paying attention for more than that and trying to keep, uh, trying to meet the needs of kids that way, um, keeping them engaged and interested is probably the most important thing I'm going to try to implement my teaching. There's a couple of ways you can teach theory of mind, and one of them is that you start with the executive function and then move to theory of mind training directly. Let me do, let me do both. Here's a great way to teach executive function. Remember, executive function has got impulse control, planning for the future, and a heuristic of just versus details with good at math. So if you want to have a good executive function, you have to check your normal impulse to fix it. <laughs> okay? And then insert it with something else. So here's how you do it. You can actually do this with adults. But you can do this with kids. Uh, it's very easy to uh, try. And this is, by golly, I think this is Adele Diamond's work at UBC. Oh my gosh. Yes. I think it is Adele's work. Here's what she does. Um, she, to teach executive function to kids, to teach adults too, she will draw a picture this is, I'm going to use the word night. Okay? And she draws, this, she doesn't use the word night. She draws a picture of the night. So you can have a moon, and it's going to be black, and maybe some stars. Does that make sense? And then Adele does something else. She then has a picture of the day. And uh, um, <laughs> so we got sun shiny, you got whatever, like this. If you're going to teach executive function to a six year old or a 60 year old, if you try this, it actually isn't all that easy to do. What you're going to say is, today is opposite day. So when I hold up a 
picture of the day. I want you to say night. Now, this is, I'm just giving the word here, but it's not the word, it's a picture. This is visually understood as a representative episodic uh, memory. Day. You know what you say night? When I hold the picture of the night, I want you to say day. Now, little six year olds have a little trouble with impulse control. Well, if you hold the picture of the day, what are they going to want to say? They're going to want to say day. See, why these little hearts are so cute. Day. Day. Night. No, 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 no. Day. Day. Night. Go. Can you guys do this? Go. Go. Switch. It gets ridiculous and hard after a while. But what it's teaching is impulse control. Because if it is true that every brain is wired differently, how could I possibly do, particularly at the molecular and cellular level, any set of experiments to try unless I had an N of 6.2 billion, which would be everybody on the planet, right? What am I going to do? Well, it turns out you can sort of think of um, brain wiring the same way you think of a uh, highway transport system. In the United States, we have big interstate highways, and we've got state highways, and then we've got boulevards in the cities, and then we've got the alleyways, okay? Um, the same thing is true in the brain. You've got big interstates, and you've got state highways, and you've got out boulevards and alleyways. At the level of the big interstates, the big trunks, every brain in this room is wired identically, not even similar, identically, okay? They are the same. So similar are they that we actually give them names based on the neurotransmitters they use. For example, there's the dopaminergic pathway. Uses dopamine, and it's the same in all of you. If you have a dopaminergic pathway, as you do, and I destroy it, it will look just like Michael J. Fox, because that's what Parkinson's does. It destroys the substantia nigra, which is the heartbeat of the dopaminergic pathway, and you all get Parkinson's. Why? Because you're all wired identities. Until you get to the boulevards and alleyways of the cities in your head, then every brain becomes wired differently. And the most interesting thing from a research perspective to tell you is that's where all the learning occurs. 